Job chapter 39. Um, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm asking the Lord for light on uh, all these critters He keeps talking about. Now, I did think of something, and I'll pass that by you. Uh, verses 1 to 4, chapter 39, dealt with goats and hinds. And I don't know if the hinds is just another name for the goats. I can't, it's hard to find out. It could be, um, could be deer. But I, I tell you what they're good at. They're good at making an escape. And that's going to matter in the tribulation. Remember, uh, a couple things. These are wild goats. He, he didn't say goats. He said wild goats, okay? Notice it says wild goats of the rock. Well, Sela Petra, that's the rock. It's the rock city. So it may be that these wild goats that escape the Antichrist could be a picture of Israel. Now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you another example. Um, in verses 5 to verse 8, you have the wild ass. Now, Job says that man is born in our, um, that man, oh, how's that go? Like a wild ass is called. Trouble. Is it born? Huh? Yeah, but I'm thinking the one about the man is like a, uh, he said he's like a wild ass's colt. Um, we've always applied that to sinners in general, but what is, Job is, deal, Job is dealing with a remnant. It's dealing with Israelites. Remember Judges 5.10, we saw that there were some princes of Israel that were riding on white asses at the second advent, whereas we will be on white horses. That Jesus Christ, when he rode in, uh, his triumphal entry was on the back of an ass. That's more connected with that Jew than it is just a broad uh, idea of, of just sinners. I realize, you know, uh, we're untamed and wild, and, and Jesus Christ can tame the, uh, the wild animal, okay? But more specifically, maybe these wild asses, because he talks about the, the, their loose bands, they're, they're running... They're in the wilderness. They're running for the wilderness. They're, uh, they're in the mountains, in verse 8. And they're searching for substance, uh, sustenance to, to survive. Uh, when they first go there, they're, in, they're still in unbelief. That's when they meet the Lord Jesus Christ. So, maybe there's some application there. Th these might all picture some, in some way or form Israel, but... It, it, I'm not quite sure if the Lord's just kind of, if He's just jumping around and you've got to put it together yourself or there's an order to it. I, I just, I don't know. But then we mentioned the unicorn. What do you do with that? Well, a unicorn's one horn. A horn represents power. It could be in reference to the Antichrist. That unicorn could be the Antichrist. Um, I don't know. And you know what He says there? He says, you can't tell Him to do anything, but I can. And the Lord can. The Lord has control of the devil, okay? The devil can't do anything unless the Lord allows him, and uh, he can tell the devil that you're going to do this, and he has to do it. Um, now, he could put suggestions in the devil's mind, like we, what he did with Job. Remember, it wasn't, it wasn't Satan that brought it up, or uh, at the time, it wasn't Satan that brought it up. It was the Lord that brought it up. Hast thou considered my servant Job? But boy, he sure did put the thought in his head, didn't he? And that is, he said, he, there's a verse we're going to get to where he can play with Satan like he's playing with a bird. You can't. God can play with that thing, that serpent, and do anything he wants because he's God. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't. He has free will and, and he's made his decision, but God can use him just like he, he can use anybody because why? Because he's God, he created everything, and if it went bad, he can still use it for his glory. And in God, many times, he used Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, to go after Judah. And he said that Nebuchadnezzar was his servant. So God can use those things. Uh, he can use the wicked things of this world um, to fulfill His will, okay? 
I know sometimes it gets a little confusing. You say, well, then God controls everything. Well, he's not controlling anybody's decisions, but he sure can. Listen, when he met Paul on the road to Damascus, I mean, there wasn't much of a decision there, but you know what? Paul was, would have made that decision. All Paul wanted was the truth. He just deceived himself into believing something that wasn't so, and he persecuted the Lord. But Paul wanted to know the Lord. He wanted to make sure that he was right. He thought he was doing right. He just wasn't. Um, anyway, so the unicorn, that might be in reference to the Antichrist. Now, verse 13 is where we pick it up. And um, he says there, verse 13, Gave us thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or, wing, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. Um, I want to underline something there that I need to... Because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted her understanding. What time she lifted up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. So now we have peacocks and ostriches. All these animals are going to picture something. There's no way that God is talking about this just to pick up. I mean, why not, why not something else but peacocks and ostriches? And you say, why? Well, there's something similar about those birds. There's something contrasting about those birds. Um, they differ. Um, well, let me, let me give it. Okay. They, va they vastly differ in appearance, but they're similar in actions. Number one, both will lay eggs in the dust. Okay? Both are not known for their flying abilities. And that is, an uh, ostrich can't fly at all, but a peacock will tend to stay on the ground and not fly at all. It will fly if it's attacked or if it uh, feels it's in danger. And it can maybe fly up to a mile, but it does not like to. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a peacock in flight. I, don't, I mean, I'm sure somebody's got film of them in flight, but I've never seen one. I've always seen them just walking around, making a bunch of noise. Hurrah, hurrah, you know. Too much noise for me. Uh, we have um, pheasants all the time. Uh, the uh, Green County Fish and Game, they release them every year, and then they, they shoot them. I think they let them run out of the cage, and those guys blast them. Well... Some of them always escape, and they come over to my property, and they sound like metal rubbing against metal. Have you ever, y'all know what I'm talking about? I can't, even, I can't even imitate it. It's, like, <laughs> anyway, it's just horrible noise, huh? I guess. Yeah, maybe a pipe sound. Um, it's, you know, it's so. I mean, I know exactly what it is, and there's nothing else I've ever heard like it, but. If you've ever heard peacocks, man, they're loud and they just they, they do that kind of call that they've got. Uh, neither fly away south for the winter. Okay, so they're similar in the fact that they're pretty much a ground bird. Okay, and an ostrich for sure. And where they differ, as in appearance, the ostrich uh, makes up for his inability to fly by speed on the ground. I mean, they're known for their speed. But you got to admit, that's probably one of the ugliest birds that's on the earth. Uh, it's got drab feathers, you know, um, short little crappy wings, you know, that all, they, they flutter and they can, he can spread them and make it look like he's bigger than what he is, but they can't fly. Um, but there's one thing about that bird, he's grounded, right? Um, verse 18 says, what time she lifted up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider, in that she can outrun a horse. Their, their speeds are up to, uh, and I guess this would be true just about any of them, good health, up to 45 mile per hour, but they've been clocked at 60 mile per hour. I mean, that's moving, you know. That's going down 42 at 60. I mean, that's, and having a peacock look over, or not a peacock, but an ostrich look over and it's right there with you. That's fast. Um, they also have the ability, their strides are, can be as much as... Now, I read two different things. Dr. Ruckman said 25 feet strides. 25 feet? What was that, here to the door? 
And that's a stride. But I, the minimum was like 20. I mean, when these things are in full, full, full throttle, man, they're just, whoo, 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 and they're moving on. And it's not that you can't find a horse fast enough. You can, because these race horses can make them run 40, 50 miles per hour. The thing is, by the time, that horse can stay right with that peacock, but only for a very short run. That peacock can go. In other words, you're going to have to have horse after horse to keep up with that animal. So they're very fast. I think typical horse speed is 30 mile per hour. But a faster horse can catch him, but he can't stay up with him. He's going to tire out. Okay, so I go to the Old Testament. I said, I need to find out if this is an unclean bird. Well, you'll find ostrich, ostriches, but you won't find them in the list back there. I found an osprey and a... Asafaja. I, I don't care. It's a weird, weird name bird, and it's a weird looking bird. But I found no ostrich in, and so I just ask, I, I just ask Google, and uh, the Jews don't eat them; they consider them unclean. And somebody said, "Well, it's their loss." There's a 130 pound chicken you could eat. <laughs> I have heard the meat is good. I mean, you know, for us Gentiles, they can eat anything. Uh, or save people that can eat anything. But I've heard the meat's fairly good. I heard, I heard it tastes like beef, not like chicken. Anyway, um, but they don't eat them. So they've got them as part of the unclean. Now, I don't find it in, in the scriptures. Could be. Uh, there's quite a few fowl that are. All your eagles and hawks and things like that are on the unclean list. Your owls. But um, it doesn't. Even though the ostrich is in there, it doesn't put him in the list. I don't know if, how many ostriches were in uh, in that area, but there was such a thing as an Arabian ostrich, and I think they. Uh, I think the Arabians killed them all. I'm not sure they're even around anymore, but there's still other ostriches around. Um, now the peacock, okay, they're similar in their actions, but they're very different in their appearance. The peacock makes up for its lack of speed and desire to fly with absolute beauty. And it's one beautiful bird. Um, peacocks were desired by kings. Look at 1 Kings 10.22. 1 Kings 10.22. You know, when somebody's going to bring you something, are you going to bring something back? I can think of a lot of things, you know, spices or things like that, and that, that happened. Um, 1 Kings 10.22, for the king uh, had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, yeah, ivory, okay, and apes. Now, I don't know, is that, is that apes, apes? Okay. Yep, look like apes to me. And peacocks, okay? I don't know if I want the apes around, but the peacocks really give, they would give a, uh, a, um, a castle or uh, a king's abode or whatever, it would, give, it would give it some real class with uh, peacocks running around. And in fact, I think in, in a lot of the movies you see where you're watching something about kings and queens and stuff, you see the peacocks walking around. It was a status symbol, I guess, for the... For royalty. Um, now there's something to be learned by this. You know, one is just has strength, but grounded. The other one prefers to be on the ground, but its beauty is its strength. Uh, when you have no particular strengths, um, your wardrobe might win the day. In other words, you know, the best dress wins. It doesn't matter whether they have any sense at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, I will say that the, uh, the one, the peacock, will roost in the trees at night. So it will fly up in, into the branches to, to get up off the ground. But between these two birds, there are three characteristics that kind of jump out. Um, cruelty, because it, he says there about the uh, ostrich, she is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. And so there's cruelty involved. There's beauty. And the fact that they're 
both grounded birds. They're typically on the ground. They prefer to be on the ground. The one has no question. He has to be on the ground. Um, so I thought, well, how am I going to apply these characteristics? Well, the first thing that came to mind was Satan. Um, look at Ezekiel 28, 17. Ezekiel 28, 17. And it says, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Huh? And then it says, Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. And it says there in verse 17, Because God hath deprived her of wisdom. A little bit different. Um, it says, uh, For thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Look at this. I will cast thee to the ground. I mean, an ostrich is, you know, he's just a grounded bird. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. So, the ostrich, that bird was perfect in beauty, just as, well, that bird, <laughs> referring to Lucifer, was perfect in beauty before his fall. But there's types of the Antichrist in the Bible, and one of them is Absalom, in whom there was no blemish, from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. But also Solomon. You remember that the, the picture in the New Testament about the flowers, that none of these were arrayed, or not even Solomon was arrayed in such glory as these, you know, a, a single flower that God makes? Well, but he was still arrayed in fine vesture. No doubt about it. Fine clothing for a king. And Solomon is at what we call dual type. He's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennial reign. And then when the women turn his heart against God, he begins, um, he begins worshiping uh, their gods, their false idols. Uh, then you find 666 connected with the amount of gold that Solomon gets in a year's time. 666 talents, I believe, of gold. And then there's talking about six lines and six steps, and there's six lines on each side. You got a six. You find two sets of six, six, six connected with Solomon, and he becomes a type of the Antichrist. Um, so we're talking about beauty there. Uh, talking about Lucifer, that bird was wiser than Daniel, but corrupted his heavenly wisdom. Um, he lacketh understanding. I believe that's what it says. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. And then he had a heart of stone. He was hardened. Um, Job 41.24 says, talking about Leviathan, that dragon, his heart is as, as firm as a stone, yea, his heart is a piece of nether millstone. Right? So you have, you have some things there that picture that, that could picture the devil, could picture the Antichrist, but... One of the things that kind of jumps out is, it's a her. Every time up there it says God has deprived her. They were not hers. Her labor is in vain. What time she... You know, a church can be like that too. One that's uh, decked out with silver and gold and doesn't care for their offspring or their children. Hmm... You know, that bird does not, this bird doesn't care about our offspring. They're just fodder for the cannons. Do you know what happens to Babylon? I mean, it just, it gets annihilated. It's like, we go on. It, there's no concern about the fact that it is obliterated and annihilated. In fact, it is the Antichrist and the ten kings that follow him that do the destroying. It's not the Lord. Now the Lord says rejoice when she's destroyed. But is it is actually the Antichrist himself that destroys Babylon. But Babylon didn't care for her, her converts either. Um, what does it say? They, uh, he said about the Pharisees, they compassed land and sea to make one proselyte and make him twofold, twofold more a child of hell than themselves. Well, that's what Roman Catholicism does. You've probably got a lot of priests that don't even believe the stuff that they're preaching. They know better, but they'll preach it anyway. And uh, 
The problem with the Roman Catholic Church, they, they believe all the fundamentals of the faith that you and I believe. They just believe in a work salvation that makes them a cult. They believe you've got to work your way to heaven. You teach that, doesn't matter what else you got, you're, you're, you're a cult and you're a heretic. Um, in John 8, 44, um, that's not, oh, John 8, 44, Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil. See, the devil's got some kids, a lot of them actually. Ye are of your father the devil, the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, when he says there, she is hardened against her young ones, you know, the, the big lie that the devil is that he cares about, he cares about his children. I mean, he, he's taking care of them. No, he's not. Oh, he, he can provide somewhat. I mean, he can give them some, uh, he can give them drugs and alcohol and thing, probably things like that. But he doesn't care about their soul at all. Turn to Ezekiel 32, and I'll, I'll show you this. And this is true of the devil. This is true of the Antichrist. This is true of that church in Revelation 17 and 18. But he says there in Exodus, this is specifically about the devil. It says uh, Ezekiel 32, verse 30 and 31. It says, There be the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Zidonians, which are gone down with the slain. And their terror, they are ashamed of their with their terror they are ashamed of their might, and they lie uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword, and bear their shame with them that go down to the pit. He's talking about someone being destroyed, going down to the pit, going to hell. Now look at verse 31. Pharaoh shall see them and shall be comforted over all his multitude. Even Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, saith the Lord God. Okay? Here's how you know he's not talking about Pharaoh the man. That is talking about a principality. He's talking about a power. First off, Pharaoh didn't see his army slain. They drowned. This is something else. And why would Pharaoh be comforted over the death of his own army? But this one is. Because Pharaoh is a type of the Antichrist, is a type of the devil, and the fact that his army perishes means nothing to him. In fact, he's comforted of it. Listen, every soul that God does not get to reclaim through the gospel of Jesus Christ is one win for the devil. It's one thing he can say, I got one of them, I got two, I got ten, I got a billion. So it says he's comforted over all his multitude. Um, now turn to Lamentations 4.3. And there's one passage that deals with the ostrich, and it likens it to the Israelites. There may be multiple applications to this. But Israel is said to have become cruel like the ostrich. Uh, Lamentations 4.3 says, Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. Okay, Probably referring to like whales and stuff. I don't know. Something there. Uh, it says, The daughter of my people is become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. They get hardened. This happened with the siege of the northern tribes. Remember that when they're getting ready, to, what, they split the baby or, so, or they ate one of the babies and, and the other woman didn't want to give up her baby then and she's crying to the king and make her give up her baby. We ate mine, now it's time to eat hers. I mean, he's like losing his mind. That's getting hard. When you go through that kind of suffering, starvation, deprivation to that degree, you change. In the camps, in the concentration camps, and I've read enough books on the concentration camps to know what the mindset was. They were one, all for, or it was not one for all, it was just all for one. Huh? You know, every man for himself. And they used 
They were actually using, you know that it wasn't the Nazis that drove them into uh, the chamber where they gassed them. Oh, they were standing there with their guns, but it was Jews that, 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 that wanted to stay alive that drove the other Jews into, the, into those chambers. And it was the Jews that hauled them out on uh, you know, big old um, wheelbarrows. It was Jews that put them in the oven and burned them up. They called them Sondermen. And they were the ones that were, they were the ones that wanted to stay alive just a little longer because they get to them too. They'd run them a while, then, okay, time to get a new set. And then they'd put them, kill them, put them in the ovens. But they did it to stay alive. And it was, I mean, it got to the point where, where they're in those barracks and they're just the most horrendous, most horrible. They were literally starving them to death. That's how they killed a lot of them. They starved them to death by working them every day in conditions that you couldn't even imagine. And you get hard. And you think about your survival. You think about that little bit of piece of bread you've got. And you would not even think about giving that to somebody else. Because you're starving too. Now you've seen the pictures. You know what... Uh, <clears throat> but that, that kind of thing happened. It happened in the siege of the northern tribes, the siege of the southern tribes... Same thing, man. They were starving. In the concentration camps of the Holocaust, that's, and that's just ones I could think of. I'm sure there's been plenty more. But suffering, um, that's, what, that's, what I, you know, that's what I hope and pray that if, if the church really goes through something before the Lord comes back, is that that kind of suffering won't harden us, it'll soften us. It'll do just the opposite. And... I have to believe that if you've got that Word of God there, because, listen, when, when the Word of God is there and that suffering takes place, it's a, it, it is a different person, but it's not a hardened one. And I believe that, can, I believe that every Christian can have that kind of heart going through suffering. Um, naturally, why do you think your government wants to get the firearms out of your hands. Because if this thing goes belly up and this country goes belly up, they're scared of you. I'm a little scared of you too. But I'm more scared of the government. <laughs> if I, I, I'm more worried about what they might try to do. I mean, you know that if they get their way, if you voted for uh, Donald Trump, you're going to a concentration camp. I mean, listen, they want to they execute the man for something that they haven't proven that he's even done yet. I mean, that's the thought going on with these people in government. And the fact that you voted for him and you wanted him in office, or at least some of you did, maybe you didn't, I don't know. Um, they want to come after you. Who would ever thought? They said that Trump supporters should now be considered domestic terrorists. I'm not a domestic terrorist. I, the last fight I got into was in the seventh grade. Okay, and I regret it. Okay, I regret it. Um, I ain't punched nobody, hit nobody, threatened nobody, haven't blown anything up, haven't pulled a gun on anybody. Ain't planning to either. Even if Joe Biden does win again. I figure what I figure is whatever whatever happens, whatever falls out, God said, you deserve this as a nation. I'm just hoping that when he says, you deserve this as a nation, but I'm coming back for my church tomorrow, you know, or, that we're getting out of here because, man, it ain't going to be good. But who knows? I, I, you know, I've said stuff before. I didn't think we'd, I didn't think we'd ever have a, a chance at even having a good economy for, for four years, but we did. But something always gets thrown in there. I don't know. Anyway, let me get on, move on to what I'm going to... So that's the only thing I can come up with on, the, on these two birds. Um, Revelation 17, 18, it's interesting that it talks about a, a cage full of birds, okay, foul birds. Um, and that's, he's talking about Babylon. That, I mean, that's, there's something there about that. And then uh, look at verse 19 to 25. It says, Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley. Was it, um, oh, who's the fella had the homes? Um, huh? Lester Roloff. He had a message called 
Have you, has, have you lost your Paul? <laughs> have you lost, he paused in the valley, have you lost your Paul? Anyway. He paused in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Now there's something else that's without fear. Uh, and I was going to mention that about the, uh, another uh, one that, uh, point about the devil is, it says he's uh, made without fear. Um, there's, well, I'm sorry, there's no fear of God before his eyes. And that was that um, ostrich. And here we have a, a horse that says, he mocketh at fear and is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. Uh, the quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He, he swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage, neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. And I'm not sure what to do with that phrase. Um, maybe he doesn't, doesn't know what it means for retreat. Uh, he saith among the trumpets, Ha ha! He smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Okay, so but there's two things there. There's a horse contrasted against a grasshopper. Um, the context is a war horse. Big difference because, you know, it's, it's like this, it's given this horse like a dual nature because horses are normally skittish and flighty. Anything but charging into a battle, they're usually running away. But if, if a horse is trained for war and trained for battle, they will charge right into it. Um, Dr. Ruckman talked about the dual nature of like a dog, uh, like his German shepherds. He said they can, he said they will just a look and they'll lower their ears and they'll, and they'll, he said, but then they'll try to tear out the throat of somebody else. Just, you know, just that dual nature. They can, they can, they can be completely subservient. And he said, you can talk to him. You can say, what are you up to? I can say it to my dog and his ears will go down. And he'll know he's done something wrong, you know. He's done something. I said, what are you doing? You know. But then he sees something he can't recognize. You know, just all of a sudden, a little bit of aggression. He's not aggressive. He's just more, he's bark. Um, that's true of this, of the horse that is trained for the battle. Um, let's see here. So instead of running from gunfire arrows, he, he's, uh, he's, okay, he says, canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper, all right? Y'all, you sneak up on grasshoppers, I did, you know, try to catch them. What's the first thing they want to do when you get close to them? Okay, so he's saying the horse doesn't act like a grasshopper and jump at the sound of gunfire or the sound of something that he's unaware of. And I've seen skittish horses, their, their eyesight's impeccable. And they can, they'll look over in the weeds and they'll stop, you know. And I'm, I remember we just get riding, getting, getting a ride on this horse. And this horse stopped. And he says, yeah, he sees something. I'm thinking, please don't let it be a snake. Please don't let it be a snake. Because <laughs> what happens is they start, they bolt. <laughs> and you're on the back. Anyway, um, so he's not going to jump like a grasshopper at, at the sound of uh, cannon fire or anything else. He's been... He's been trained for war. Uh, cavalry um, has been a part of every major battle from about 2000 B.C. even into the Second World War. The Polish were still on horseback against Germany. Um, um, now, I had a guy tell me one time, he said, you know, when I was talking about uh, uh, a cavalry going into going in from Israel in the tribulation, he said, no, that can't be. And I said, well, what the Bible says, you know, and at the time I didn't, I didn't know why I believed it. I just believe it. That's, that's a lot of stuff in the scriptures. I just believe it. But you know, if you're going to cross terrain, one thing about mechanized warfare, you know, tanks and jeeps, and they don't do very good in the mountains or going through very uh, tight passes or, or, I mean, you just can't, you just can't do it. I mean, fly over them if you want to. Um, I know in Afghanistan, I mean, the helicopter was, but what if you can't get anything in the air? What if it's impossible to fly in anything? 
because somebody keeps calling down fire and blowing it out of the sky. Somebody with the ability to call down fire and burn up military men like Elijah. And what if the only way to, and maybe that's not even happening, but what if, there, what if the only way to really go in and invade that land, because by the way, you can't win a war with just, um, just aircraft. Uh, the only way to invade that land was to dry up the Euphrates, which happens, but then you're talking about crossing mountain ranges and, and, and very wilderness and not good for mechanized warfare, but you can make it with a horse. And that may be what happens. Don't ever count your Bible out. And it's like, you know, there's no such thing as a bottomless pit. Oh, sure there is. You know, if you've got a donut in a hole in the earth and it's turning and you're in it, you can keep following as long as it turns. It's bottomless. There you go. I mean, nobody believed that. They wouldn't believe the scriptures, you know. They don't believe in a burning lake of fire. Yet, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lake just south of Jerusalem that's full of bitumen. And it used to be full of uh, sulfur. It still is probably full of sulfur in the bottom of it. And you said that sulfur used to float to the top. They used to collect it. You, and it's been known to catch on fire. There's actually, been, there's actually been documentation of the Dead Sea catching on fire. Parts of it. But if you set that thing on fire, you know that everything feeds into it. Nothing goes out. And the salt solution, 26 times saltier than the Atlantic Ocean. You can't submerge. You just float. So if you get thrown into it, you've been cast into a lake of fire. There's where the lake of fire begins. It goes into eternity. Now, I don't know if they're the same. I guess they are. Or I know that the Antichrist gets thrown in in the millennium, before the millennium, and he's still there after a thousand years. It says where the beast and the false prophet are in that lake of fire. Nobody thought that could be true either. It sure can. I mean, when you got, nothing, when you got tar as thick as, uh, I mean, they used, to, they used to gather that tar that floated out there on that sea. Uh, Arabians would gather it. It'd be, it'd be as big as uh, elephants, man. And they would, uh, that bitumen, and they would cut it up and sell it. It was great. And, this, and the sulfur, the uh, um, brimstone, that's what, that's what brimstone is, sulfur. It was highly prized, okay? So your Bible tells you something like that. And by the way, it's 1,300 feet below sea. It's the lowest place on planet Earth or as far as the Earth itself, not the seas, but it's the lowest place on Earth, 1,300 feet below sea level. And you find that God kindles a fire there in the south country, and that fire is going to burn forever once he kindles it. And you have the lake of fire in the millennium that people could be cast into, and it's just south of Jerusalem. Hey, who would believe that? But it's possible. God showed it that it's possible and it will happen. Anyway, um, where was I at? Revelation 16. Revelation 16. It says, uh, The sixth angel poured out his vial. I'm sorry, verse uh, 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. And the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I believe the number of that thing, I don't know if I've got it here, but the number of it is like 200 million. Um, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. In other words, man, they are drawing them. Listen, if there's a three and a half year drought, and all of a sudden they hear there is rain in Palestine, <laughs> that everything is growing, it's green, and they've just suffered 42 months or something about that, about that of nothing but no rain, and, and, and you talk about an invasion. They want to invade that area. Um, something else that God gave the horse strength. Hast thou given the horse strength? Talking to Job, of course not. Job didn't, but God did. And we measure uh, power today as horsepower. Uh, key words give us clues to how this applies. 
in the future. And number one is, the, as he says there, he paweth in the valley. And where this thing winds up, where this, this war horse winds up is in a valley. It's the Valley of Megiddo. Uh, the mountains of Armageddon. Um, Joel 3.14 says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And then notice it mentions not only the valley, but it mentions the trumpets. The trumpets. Revelation 8.2 says, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Revelation 8.6 says, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now, when you get toward the end of those last of those trumpets, that's when, that's when that, that war, that battle takes place. Um, look at Revelation 9, and there's quite a few, quite a bit of information on this in the book of Revelation. Revelation 9, verse 13 to 16. It says, one woe is past, behold, I'm sorry, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded. There were seven trumpets. The sixth angel just sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels which were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. That's 200 million. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of japheth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Hmm. Okay. I'm not sure. Well, let me go on down through here and I'll make a, another comment here about what, what else they could be. The battle. Um, notice the battle is mentioned in verse 25. Not only the trumpets that they say, ha ha. You know, you say, ha ha. There's nothing to them. They're not worried about the alarm being sounded. They're not worried about... It's like... It could be in reference to the Lord's army, of course. Could be in reference to both armies, I guess. Uh, Revelation 16, 14. It says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then the last clue would be in verse 25 also where it says the captains. Because all these are a part of Armageddon and in, in, in the, in the wordings used that you have these captains. Revelation 19, verse 17 to 19. I'm about done, folks. I know you're getting tired. It says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and them that sit on them. That's why I said don't rule out the fact that it could be cavalry that is literally attacking uh, the promised land. Um, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Eventually, they're going to uh, point their guns up. <laughs> they're going to make war against the Lord. And he says there um, in verse, let's see, where is that? Back up to verse 19, where it says, the, Hath thou clothed his neck with thunder? Let me give you a couple verses in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 2.11 says, And it came to pass as they went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, now look at this, and horses of fire, 
And we just read about some, something that, that was a horse that looked like a head of a lion. And it says fire comes out of its mouth or whatever. Now we got horses of fire mentioned, and they're the ones taking Elijah up. That's why I said I'm not certain which army we're talking about here, but we could be talking about the fact uh, both of them in some ways. But it says horses of fire, and it parted them both asunder. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Um, Verse 20 says, Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. Now, I will say this. If, you ever, if you've ever seen a horse that is, you know, winded or whatever, and in the cold air, I mean, it just, that steam just kind of shoots out both them nostrils. It's like a locomotive. I mean, it's pretty impressive. But imagine if there's glory usually in flurs light or, you know, yeah, like fire. Can you imagine fire coming out of them nostrils? I mean a horse that breathes fire. Man, I want one of them. Um, 2 Kings 6.17 See, all these things he's saying up here, there, there's an application to Daniel's 70th week, always. And probably every verse that we've read through Job, there's an application somewhere. Um, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Hmm. So maybe we are going to be on one of them fiery steeds. One of them fiery... You know, I don't know why God has Israel riding an ass and us riding a horse. But I am glad I'm going to be on a horse. <laughs> Um, Revelation 9.17. And he says there, And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then that sat on them. Okay, I read that before. Having breastplates of fire, Jason brimstone. It says, Out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. But that's something, is something that uh, comes out of the bottomless pit, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. The, he's talking about that all the way up to verse 11. And then he talks about this army that comes across. And these. there's no telling what kind of un, uh, weird, strange thing. It's like, a, it's like reading um, Revelation and understanding what's going to happen in that last three and a half years. It's like reading every science fiction book you've ever read. And there being truths that you can pull right out of that book and put right in there. I mean, you've got Jekyll and Hyde. You've got... Uh, you've got vampires, you've got uh, the beast, or I'm sorry, uh, um, the mummy, because <laughs> it comes back to life. Uh, let's see, what have you, give me some others here. I can't think of, werewolf, wolfman, yeah. I mean, all of that, it's a truth that they've taken and, and, and created something, but there's truth to it. He does appear as a man, and then he's a beast, Okay. What's the other guy? Um, um, Beauty and the Beast. The beauty is Israel. The beast is the Antichrist who, who, who makes a, a uh, covenant with him. So you've got, you've got all these things, and, and, and you, you don't even realize it. But the very things that, you're, uh, that you think, oh, so, uh, it's amazing somebody thought that up. You know? Yeah, but there's some truth to it. Why? Because it came from the Bible. You just got to realize that it, that it does, and then you start thinking, seeing things a little bit clearer. So, well, that's going to happen. The world don't know it, but their worst nightmare, whatever it might be, is coming to pass. It's going to happen. And it will be a nightmare. Dr. Rutman said that Muhammad had a nightmare. A mare that he rode. Huh. Anyway. Okay. Um, it mentions there not only the thunder of the... or the, um, the I'll get it right here in a minute. The neck with thunder, but it mentions the thunder of the captains in verse 25. Captains don't walk into battle, they ride. 
That's just the way it works. Um, captains have been thundering into battles, whether on horses or mechanized machines, for about four millennia and counting. Um, but typically, they're up until, what, last 150 years, they were on horseback. And they would, you know, you can hear the thunder of the hooves. They thunder into battle. You hear them horse hooves, you know, you know that you're being attacked or whatever. And it says, it talks about the thunder of the captains. Um, so you could apply, you might be able to apply this to the Lord's army. You could apply it to um, Satan's army that's going to be fighting against the Lord at the second advent. Could be in reference to both. Uh, I did read somewhere one time about the, the you know, this is the last thing I'll say about it, the Civil War. Um, and that is, the, those horses, I mean, the, the, the rider could be shot off, the horses would still go straight through the line. Uh, they, they would charge a machine gun, nest. I mean, back when, I mean, different, barely had, barely invented the machine gun, but the Gatling guns, all, but a, a horse will go right, a war horse will go straight into it. Even if the rider gets shot off, many of them will keep going. And... But during the Civil War, they said one of the worst things on the battlefield was those wounded horses. It was bad enough that you might be laying out there, you know, with uh, an arm blown off or a leg blown off or just wounded and dying, but to hear them horses. I guess the screams and the, the sounds coming out of them things, it made, made them go mad. They just about couldn't take it. That's one of the things that, that happens. But... Those animals can be trained to be just about fearless. And I think the, the, the war horse you're going to be on coming back is going to be afraid of nothing. And probably like us, it says over there in Joel, if we fall on the sword, we're not going to be injured. We'll just get right back up. Talk about immortal. And I want my horse to be immortal. I'm sure he will be. Okay, now we got, maybe he's got a big old horn like a unicorn. He's fire breathing. Okay, he can fly. Oh, yeah. I've never had a ride like that. That'd be good. And nobody would be able to stand before you. Anyway, that's all I got on that. I, I wish I could give you something more definite on what they apply to. But uh, And the part here... Um, He says he swallowed the ground with fierceness and rage, and that's they, they do kind of, you know, when they're moving along the ground, I guess you could say that, but neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. Anybody? I don't even know what that means. Unless it's like the sound of retreat or something. I don't know. Okay. Nope. Okay. All right. We'll keep praying.